Hey there, fellow Monster Ranchers, I'm Pruitt, and this is Jim Davis. You're going to need to shine up your shield guardians, gussy up those gargoyles, and dust off your dimmy liches, because today we're going to show you how to get the most out of your monster on WebDM. This episode is brought to you by Dungeon Fog's Project Dios Alpha 1, live now. Project Dio sets out to revolutionize map making by creating a bundle of tools with tabletop role playing in mind. Create your interconnected worlds, regions, cities, and battle maps with everything from political borders to climate boundaries to interactive objectives. It's never been easier to create maps for any kind of game. Check it out, links in the description and the comments. So let's, let's talk about monsters. Let's talk about yeah. getting the most out of them. Yeah. So let, let, let's let's set them up for this episode, Jim. Let's sure. Let's, I'm sure. Gonna go let's ahead do and set the ball to you. I'm going to give you a bump and you spike it right. here. What, there we what go. are we looking for here? So monsters are a core part of D and D. They're they're really there to help define the fantasy elements of the setting. They're potential antagonists or allies of the PCs. And you know the monster manual describes them as like a monster is any creature that can be interacted with and potentially fought or killed and they're usually threats that are meant to be stopped. And when I'm thinking mm -hmm. that, I was like, they're, but they're more than that, right? They enhance our games when we treat them as, as something more than just combat opponents. And so when we consider yeah. the place of monsters in our settings, what their origins are, what their motivations are, how they impact the setting, we can create something that goes beyond a stat block. And then we can create avenues for the players to like engage in all three pillars of play. Because I think a lot of times people think monster, combat, and then the other two, you know, the exploration and the social interaction pillars get uh, get left on the wayside. Well, I mean, that's very true. Um, but the thing is, in order to get to your monster, you're going to have to explore your environment. You're going to oh, have yeah. to go find it. It's, I mean, like it can't, you can't always as a DM just, oh, the monster runs up to you or the, right. the thing flies up to you. It's like sometimes you got to go track these things down. So exploration is kind of a big thing, right? Certainly. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I mean, and this works at like the, the small scale level, right? Like the little CR one quarter type monsters that, that may or may not seem like they have a big impact on the setting up through the like mm -hmm. big legendaries, which literally alter the landscape and, and environment yeah. around them. And so like we can highlight that part of our games by thinking about like hints, hurdles and hazards that are related to the monster and, and their impact on the setting. Now, hints might be things like, you know, I want to know who dwells here. Who's a part of this land? Maybe the PCs are on like a hex crawl type thing or they're rolling around your sandbox. They're not looking for a specific monster, but they want to know what they might encounter there. Um, similarly, if they're looking for a specific monster, then giving them clues to that monster is a good way to like hint and foreshadow, give them some information that they might need so that they can then make a decision about how they want to approach it or prepare for this encounter. So yeah. it's worth thinking about like, what can we learn about a creature from the location that it's in? You know, what, what, mm -hmm. uh, what does someone else in the setting know about that? Is there any research that the PCs can do? Like those are, that's yeah. where I start usually with these kinds of things. Those hints. Um, hmm. One, a story that I like thinking about, uh, like they've just reintroduced wolves to like Yellowstone National Park or whatever. And they mm -hmm. realized that when they reintroduced a predator, like rivers became more stable because mm. the prey animals had stopped eating all the vegetation along the riverside, which caused more sure. erosion. Sure. So having a monster in an area, looking at how the prey animals react, like no, like if you see a lot of prey animals, okay, that monster's probably not in here. That could be a hint. Yeah, um, yeah, versus definitely. you don't see anything. Oh, crap. It's right behind me, isn't it? You know, yeah. and so I, I, I just think that's a, a an interesting story that that kind of goes along with that. But uh, I, It really is. And it's a good way to like highlight the specific expertise of some characters. That's something that someone <laughs> say proficient in survival or a ranger or a druid, certain types of barbarians. Like even if the player doesn't draw that conclusion, you as a DM can go, you know what? Your character notices this. And your character who's provision in survival or nature or whatever understands that this is the significance. You don't have to give them everything, but giving them enough yeah. to know that I should consider this when I'm making a decision 
that's what these hints are for, right? Mm-hmm. And when we think, start thinking more about how they impact the environment, like what, what kind of traces are they physically leaving, right? Like oh, if right, there's some right. sort of scaled beastie in the area, are there not molted <laughs> scales, you know, things that it's rubbed off, <laughs> you know, on trees and rocks and things? Is there a kill that it's left behind? And is it quite uh, finished with? Maybe it's stashed it somewhere. Like what sort of synths and tracks and Mm -hmm. broken vegetation? Yeah, all of that kind of stuff, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Like broken claws left behind, uh, you know, just pieces of itself. Uh, The remnants of its passing um, are are definitely a a, a big part in, I mean, maybe not, it maybe won't tell you where it is. It at least tells you where it's been, its range. You know, how far does it move out to hunt? Um, things yes. like that. Certainly things like that. Yeah. And uh, sort of building on the hints at some point, you know, if they're on the way to track down this monster, especially in wilderness, things like that, like what are some obstacles that they might encounter? Even like it's mm-hmm. not necessarily related to the monster, but they're just part of the environment that they're in. You know, if it's like rocky, mm-hmm. hilly terrain, how do they move about? How difficult is it? Uh, maybe they're going to face some sort of challenge in actually finding the creature or its lair or something like that. Um, has there been, is there like more than a certain type of vegetation or something like this? Like I'm thinking of something like uh, pine barrens or something like that. Some kind of vegetation where frequent fires only allow one type of, of plant or, or something to take root because they're, they grow fast. Right. And so mm-hmm. certain trees aren't going to grow there because it's routinely subjected to fire. Well, that might suggest that some sort of fire creature is nearby, something that's like inadvertently starting wildfires or blazes or something. And you can like work in those details. Honestly, this is why I do a, a deep Wikipedia dive on like, geography and ecosystems and various types of biomes <laughs> whenever I'm creating a setting uh, just because I want to know what these places are really like. This isn't just a bog. Like, what's in a bog? Why, why do bogs form? You know, mm-hmm. uh, then you run across weird things like disappearing lakes <laughs> and rivers and things that that go underground uh, at certain times of the year. Like, your players might think that's utterly fantastic or like, you know, like unbelievable. It's like, no, they're really all over the place. (laughs) Mm -hmm. You can find these in our world. Well, Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, but also it could be, it could be a a, a sign of a underground dwelling creature that just made a new home. And now that river's gone or that lake's gone because it's down below now. Um, Yeah. Yeah. And if you're following the exploration rules, that might mean that you're not able to forage for water or something like that, or it's much more mm-hmm. difficult to find. This is why I don't like discarding elements of the rules of the game because they seem unfun. Because you never know when being able to say, yeah, you, you know, you guys are usually tracking down your food and things like that, unless someone wants to spend the spell slot to not have to worry about that. Um, but nevertheless, mm-hmm. you would notice that this is happening and this is then that goes from a hurdle to a hint. Right. Um, right. right. Wild the life, lack right. of prey animal. Yeah. The lack of prey mm-hmm. animals and water in an area because it's been yeah. gobbled all up by some big baddie. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. Or what, what animal or, or creature has taken advantage of the fact that there's a larger monster here. Like they might not necessarily be working together, but you know, if you've got a big beastie that is killing things and not necessarily like, eating all of it they're leaving behind these carcasses and things then what sort of carrion eaters show up in the Mm -hmm. wake of that um what other sorts of creatures might take advantage of the fact that this other creature lives nearby if you're like a really big beast then maybe like that cuts out all the mid-tier predators right which might allow a certain Mm -hmm. type of sort of base creature either a certain prey animal or smaller scavengers to flourish because they're not being preyed on by the mid-tier big guy doesn't care about that right uh so those are different ways that you can just krill to him (laughs) right (laughs) right and if you're relying on hunting to help get you through Uh if you're relying on like yeah it really would be nice to have some of those mid-tier animals and uh, you know to eat ourselves um then that could potentially be another uh, another hurdle or a hint you know a lot of these are interchangeable yeah Uh, yeah it's true i was gonna say like uh find or finding like some kind of creature that is found in the wake of your big, big monster, 
much like mm-hmm. uh, what is it, grouper fish with sharks that yeah. that just kind of like hang on underneath and keep their scales oh, sure. clean, you know, like that. Yeah. I mean, that's that's where you like the to me that's like the dragon with kobolds, like you know, he, he keeps them around to groom him and all that. And so climb in my be, mouth and pick my teeth, kobold. <laughs> yeah, pick my teeth and you better do a good job. Right. Or you'll have to pick up the last ears. guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. These could be hazards. These easily go yep. from hurdle to hazard, right? If uh, the tree, you know, if, if, if you know, something's been deforested or, or, or something like that, then maybe mudslides, floods, uh, you know, whatever oh, now yeah. are go from being like, eh, this is kind of a pain to deal with, or like, oh my God, this is going to fundamentally change how we approach uh, this creature. Mm-hmm. So just their impact in this way. We're just talking like indirectly. Traversing all of that is an adventure in and of itself, right? Like I think a lot of games, the the attitude is like, well, you get there. You you show up right where the action is, right? That's fine sometimes. But a lot of times like the getting there is, for lack of a better word, the story, the adventure. And Mm -hmm. I think like thinking about these things is how you give that depth and richness instead of just being like roll survival, you get there, you know, (laughs) like, how? What's that look like? Anything happen along the way? (laughs) Some people just want the cheat codes, though. Um, Sure, right, yeah. (laughs) Yeah, I'm with you. Uh, You know, a a, a big monster redirecting a river into what should have been a nice meadow and an easy way to approach where you're going, now it becomes like, you know, like a a boggy swamp. Um, Yeah. One that hasn't been charted, so you don't know where there is uh, set ground, and there are no yeah. trails through it because it is a recent event. I mean, yeah. you know, that's I, I don't I don't know that I'd want to traverse that. Certainly, right, and and it seems like that you could then take that a step further and go like, if this is a sudden or recent change to the environment, could it be a clue that something really big has moved in, and just their supernatural mm-hmm. presence has started to change the landscape? We're talking about like bogs mm-hmm. and, and sudden wetlands or something. Could that mean that a black dragon <laughs> is now here? Like that they took up a layer in, in what was a smaller, more contained type of marsh or something. And now it's grown despite the fact that it doesn't yeah. necessarily have more water feeding into it by which it would grow just the presence of this creature. Or if we're thinking less of like beasts and things, could this be, you know, the evidence of like, a wizard or a mage or something summoning a certain type of thing. And then the repeated opening of these portals to supernatural realms has an effect on the prime material plane, you know, or, or something like that. This is just the physical landscape. If you start thinking about like, all right, there's a necromancer nearby. All of the cemeteries are suddenly empty, right? Or, or the villages have people missing from them and they just don't want to talk about it because they've been intimidated into it. Like, taking it beyond the, the physical landscape to like the social landscape and, and you know, the, how civilization might change or the, the way people live. This is part of the exploration tier, <laughs> you know, a pillar rather. <laughs> and say you are able to get past those hurdles and hazards. Mm-hmm. You might then find yourself at the door of their lair. Right. And that, I mean, now you're entering a whole different kind of world. Um, yeah. Yeah. And, I think this is where a lot of people, especially a lot of DMs, sort of start considering I'm, I'm playing an exploration pillar, right? Like I've got mm-hmm. to physically climb over things. I've got to, to deal with traps and puzzles and, and the navigating of, of a dungeon or a lair or something. That's like certainly part of it, but getting there is, is half the fun. And like both of those elements, the getting to the lair and the navigating the lair those are also at places that you can start draining resources, <laughs> you know? Oh yeah. I think a lot of times DMs are concerned that they're going to, you know, the party's going to get to the big fight and they're going to have everything. <clears throat> They've got all their hit dice, all their abilities, all their spell slots. And they're also concerned about throwing a bunch of pointless, just filler combats, both because they're going to take up table time because they don't feel like they're a part of the world. Designing some sort of environment and then layer or adventure location rather with an eye towards like, this is going to use up their resources. It's going to be a pain to travel across this place. So maybe it's going to take up, you know, instead of exhaustion levels, spending hit dice or, you know, they're going to need to some of their spell slots where they're going to need to prepare certain spells, 
like that they then take up the uh, something that they might otherwise have chosen just to get across this place like create or destroy water right you know that's a that's a spell that i think some people see as like it negates a part of the exploration uh play that they want to do they want to have but what if it doesn't what if that's the cost and what if the yeah. fact that they need to prepare that or good berry or whatever like that means they're not taking something else that means that they don't have like 100% combat loadout in order to uh to tackle the you know when the final confrontation comes down and of course dms uh, no you should not let them have that one long rest before the big fight no <laughs> <laughs> and if they need one all part of it right <laughs> then use that time you know the that the other thing with this is that the monsters this is their territory and they might have formed alliances with other creatures they might have you know pressed other creatures into their service they might have set up some sort of way of of you know you know letting them know when someone's coming close to their lair and so like if the party wants to take a rest before they tackle this thing why is the creature just sitting there waiting for them you know why mm -hmm. why aren't they being more proactive in this and to me this really starts to highlight that the three pillars of play are not separate they're not these distinct like silos in fact calling them pillars is probably a <laughs> leads to a, a conception that they are separate. They interrelate to each other so much, right? They all lead into the other. Well, I think that the way to bring that back into it is if the whole house is your game, if you have one pillar that is lacking, your house will crumble. If you only have a giant combat pillar and you are not reinforcing your game with exploration and, and societal interaction, <laughs> then, you know, House divided cannot stand Jim. Um. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Uh, I I really see all of them related, but I but uh, the bonds between social interaction and a combat encounter, I find are very closely related. Like exploration's there; it's it's not like off on its own. <laughs> but mm -hmm. combat and and social interaction are so intertwined. Because they both involve like interpersonal conflict potentially. And so oh, yeah. the one can go from the other, can go from the other very quickly. And thinking about how your monster relates to the other creatures in its environment will then help understand like what goals that it has, what motivations that it has, what are the stakes mm -hmm. of fighting it or, or uh, you know, engaging with it in this encounter. Well, yeah, because, I mean, once you find it, like, you have to make that decision. Is this something that you need to fight? Or could you yeah. talk your way out of it? Is, right. there, is there a benefit to finding some way to resolve this without combat? Certainly, yeah. I think that that's, I think keeping that on the table makes for a more interesting game. And it certainly mm -hmm. makes for a game that has, a, that has a variable pace, variable flow, which creates more interesting situations uh, and seeking some sort of nonviolent interaction or, or being at least open to it leads to these situations where <clears throat> not every problem needs to be solved in a certain way. Some classes and, and some of the options that players might have invested in become more relevant. And I know everybody yeah. makes fun of the bard who tries to seduce everything, but like, I would love to have that player <laughs> in my game. That sounds really interesting and like would lead to a lot of uh, uh, more interesting choices and consequences and the like for the campaign, as opposed to just there's a monster, let's fight it, roll initiative, you know? We're sticking with like the benefits to talking through your problems as opposed to punching through them. Sure. Um, <laughs> what, what are, what are some of the, uh, what, are, what are some of the things that you, that you see um, mm -hmm. as, as an outcome of this. Yeah. So some of the benefits that I see of, of keeping nonviolent interaction on the table when dealing with uh, your monsters are that it really favors faction based play. And, and I think D and D mm -hmm. excels when you have multiple factions competing with, or, or potentially allying with the PCs. And so a lot of times like PCs versus one organization, but like even just throwing in another group whether it's a rival adventuring party 
whether it's someone else who who like has a similar goal to the, the, what the players want, but they have a different means of getting it, or it's like the there's a ally to their antagonists who's you know the allies are like uh, maybe we don't care for this creature we've allied with, and the players can create mm-hmm. a rift between them. Like all of those things become possibilities when you consider who else might be interested in this monster or what the monster's doing, something like that. A good example of that, I think, is uh, the Witcher episode where they're going after the dragon. Yeah. You have all of these competing interests, but uh-huh. they they form alliances in order to get to the end, like with the dwarves. Um, and And so there is that social interaction right up until the point where it's like, nope, we're near at the end now. Screw all you guys. <laughs> like, right. Like, yeah. I, I love that episode for that. I, I know that there's there's some groups who just, they want to fight the monster. They want to kill it. They don't want any, they want to think about it. They don't want any complications. That's fine. Like, do that. <laughs> but have, mm-hmm. leaving yourself open for more uh, can really, really enhance the game and make it more than just a monster fighting game, which I think people will eventually grow bored with, you know? I, shake I, things did. Up. I mean, yeah, Certainly, I did. Right? Like in the beginning, that's what I wanted to do. I thought, hey, this is what you do, right? There are these monsters. Yeah. They need to be killed. Uh, you get some XP. You get some loot. You're a little bit yeah. better at it. You can go buy mm-hmm. and fight the next biggest thing and move right. on up and you get glorious. And this is how your name is, you know, sung through the annals of history or whatever. <laughs> but then you start thinking like, wait a minute. Yeah, I could talk to this person because I know they hate this other thing I have to fight later. And yeah. while I'm only wanting to do this to get better and to get their stuff, what if I talk to them about sharing their stuff? And now sure. I also have an ally to fight the thing later. Yeah. Enemy of my enemy. I yeah. mean, that's, yeah. you know, the reason why that, that saying that's... is so cliche. <laughs> Yeah, that's classic mega dungeon play, right? Like there's multiple factions of some sort of humanoid or whatever in the first few levels of the dungeon. And you could clear them all out if you wanted. But the smarter move, the the less work, (laughs) the less risk to you is to just sort of scout the place out. What's their relationship like? Are the kobolds fighting the goblins? Do the orcs hate the hobgoblins? Are they all against the lizard folk? Like that lets you understand the social relationships of what's going on and then make a choice about how you want to approach that as opposed to we show up, we're going to SWAT team this <laughs> and yeah. take everyone out. <laughs> You're now kind of treating it like a, like a proper expedition. And mm-hmm. the further benefit of that is that you can throw monsters at the party and have them interact with them that are way outside their league. Right, like have them come across just an ancient dragon when they're second or third level, and it's just sunning yeah. itself in a glade or chilling out in the dungeon because who knows how it got there? It doesn't matter that it's big, it's a dragon, maybe it squeezes through doors or burrows through the ground or teleports or something. Right, like the mm-hmm. obsession with how it got there is less important than the fact that it is there and you weren't expecting it. And what can you know, well, what, what could potentially come from that? Well, and also, can it polymorph? Have you already met this dragon? Sure. Will you meet this I dragon in the it, future? Yeah. I, I think the throwing a dragon at a, at a low-level party, they meet them, and then as they continue to adventure, oh, they're going to meet him again. They just won't know it. You gave them the clue. Well, he was. they were in a cavern with a human-sized tunnel, and that's all you saw. So they, obviously they have to become human-sized to get out. I mean... I don't know. To me, that's just like you, you, you're you just given breadcrumbs. You just sprinkle them all around and let them figure it out. Let them figure it out. Would, yeah. Yeah. A demon or something else, right? Like a creature that is and not necessarily trapped, but like a, a free and completely at will to just wipe out the party, but it's choosing not to. That should be a clue for the players that they can, that there's something available here. That if this mm-hmm. creature of, of immense power didn't just snuff them out effortlessly, then maybe it wants them around. Maybe it could benefit from the, the players there. Maybe the players could benefit from working with it for a while. Of yeah. course, all of that does lead to some drawbacks, right? Like, this isn't all uh, sunshine and, and uh, benefits. <laughs> well, I mean, if you come across a demon and you have a paladin in your party, you know, 
<laughs> depending on what you kind of palette, right? issues. Like, <laughs> not depending on what kind, but I, I'm just drawing on the, you know, the generalization sure. of the champion of good finding something of utter evil. They're probably yeah. going to want to run right up to it and try to kill it, no matter what. Probably, probably. I think a, I think the smart uh, and considerate paladin would be, what's this thing doing here? Like, it needs to go. Yeah, but it's not, not going to be suicidal in it. Is there a way to eliminate it by its source? You know, if some mm. other, if something brought it here, maybe they could send yeah. it back. What is it that it wants? What what purpose is, does it have here? You know, if, is if it a scout out, for a larger force? Right. Yeah. Is it a scout for a larger force? Is it here for some other reason, like some errand for some, you know, some other force or something like that? Some wizard that summoned it? Then maybe allowing it to temporarily get away so that you can catch a bigger fish is the thing that's going to lead to the most good, <laughs> right? Yeah. But at the same time, it does require the players to have a bit of a nuance to their senses of morality for their characters. And, and really the, the world at large, you, you, might, you, might, you might find it easier to just say, we're going to throw out alignment entirely and, and go for just a completely ambiguous... Uh, world where any morality or ethical considerations that uh, you know you want your characters to have are entirely their own and not enforced by by anything you know mm -hmm. and once you've done that once you can't assume that the monster is evil you know this, basically this is the premise of Eberron right <laughs> like we don't know yeah any of these creatures they're just they have their own motivations they don't have an alignment you know well yeah and um and also, well, you would think, though, if your players are going to talk to a lot more things instead of just bust down the door and kill them, yep. then the DM is going to have a little bit more work on their hands. Certainly. In order to get the most out of social interaction, they're essentially going to have to create a social stat block for their creatures. The current mm -hmm. stat blocks are largely combat focused. So, like, crack open that DMG to the section on creating NPCs and can give them mannerisms and personalities, ideals and bonds and flaws, bring them to life as, as a creature who is active and has agency in the world and not just a thing for the players to fight. And yeah. you can do this for almost anything. I mean, even beasts, right? Like what kind of animal immediately attacks a person? Right, like you have to corner them. Rabbit or They've injured. Got... Uh, <laughs> right, you've got to be threatening season. their young or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so considering those things, like how does it behave? Yeah, it's more work for the DM, but that more work will pay off in a richer and, and more varied experience for the players. And, mm -hmm. and that's going to keep them going longer. It's going to keep them interested longer because it's not the same thing week after week, session after session. Um. Yeah, I mean that. Yeah, that is going to you're going to alter your players like expectations of what, what, what will happen when they interact with this thing. Some players don't want to change their expectations, right? Mm -hmm. They're they are not here to explore an in depth world with nuance and and you know they have to consider their actions. Part of the appeal of a role playing game like Dungeons and Dragons or, or those of its uh, you know same similar type is that you don't have to think that you can just engage in unproblematic violence as a way to blow off steam, escape, just have a fantasy, you know? Like, I, yeah. I think that we shouldn't discount the fact that a lot of people play to have a power fantasy, that they might not have that in their lives, and that this is a moment that they get to live vicariously as someone who can. <laughs> they can act without needing to consider. They can act without having to worry about the consequences too much. They might not have that in their real life, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And so this is one of those things where just like, hey, what do you guys expect? Is this fun? You know, is this interesting to you? Does this create a, a, a better experience at the table? Um, you know, but like anything, seeing what the players want and, and, you know, how they're approaching the game is going to make things easier on you. Maybe take some work off of your, you know, your hands. Yeah, but I, I think like you said... Um... Uh, constantly changing the player's expectations on on uh, on any given interaction will keep their interest on the in the long term because mm -hmm. they can't just roll up in here and just start laying waste to everything you have to worry about the repercussions worry about who their friends are who the enemy's friends are 
is the enemy a, an enemy of your enemy? You, 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 you start to like have a much wider array of options as a player. If you're willing to, to choose to have that, that's the thing about it is it's all up to the player on like, no, this is an enemy because you see it as an enemy. Mm -hmm. Do you have to see it as an enemy? Can it be an right. ally? Can it be an, a, a source of information? Um, yeah. And so you could always I don't know, fight it like later. Challenging, yeah, you could always <laughs> fight it later. But challenging your players' expectations is a way to make them, I don't know, a better player. I mean, I, you certainly did over the years and changed me, like to to someone who is who is more of just like, how best can I use this encounter to further my character's goals, ambitions, you know, everything. Yeah, and, and thinking of some thinking of an encounter is more than like a, a stage for a very tactically detailed fight, and the encounter mm -hmm. is an opportunity for the players. the The interaction with the world is an opportunity for the players to get something out of it, to learn something, to mm -hmm. find an ally. Like I said, like this is one of those reasons why I do not see the bard trying to seduce a monster as circumventing anything. It doesn't, you know. You might have been hoping for a fight, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if yeah, if something is circumvented because they talked someone down, or they were able to yeah. to appeal to a creature's uh, you know sense of self preservation or what it wants, you know, self interest, and like, okay, that's one more way you have to interact with the world. And if we want to talk about reducing the workload on a DM, like the fact that not every encounter needs to be a tactically rich, engaging combat that that stimulates all of our, you know, various chemical receptors in our brain and everything. Like, what if you don't need to do that every time? <laughs> what if yeah. you save those things for the big, the big uh, set pieces, you know? Because as we all know, Jim, love is a battlefield. So Certainly. it's just a different way of fighting. <laughs> it's just a different way of fighting. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Jim. So <clears throat> talking about social interaction here, and so how, how, what, what can a DM do to, mm. uh, to further and to, uh, to, I don't know, to massage these into the game to, yeah, yeah. To, to make to, it easy, to, to make it easier on themselves, yeah. you know, yeah. yeah, I think the DM can do a lot of things by having some various tools and techniques in their, you know, in their repertoire, uh, to, to make mm -hmm. these encounters engaging and interesting, uh, on the social level. And I cannot sp speak highly enough of the reaction role. And this is a mechanic brought in from, uh, you know, old school Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, it's yeah. a 2d6 role. And the idea is that you have uh, categories at two, which is the absolute worst, worst outcome, attack on site, you know, yeah. whatever. Uh, three through five is like, they're suspicious, could get violent, but, you know, if the players do something, if, if they make some sort of overture of, of friendliness or, 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 you know, we're not here to fight, you know, necessarily, if they don't show up with weapons in their hands, <laughs> then this could lead to some more talk. Six through eight, the most likely outcome is neutral. And depending on what kind of creature or monster it is, this might be beneficial for the party. It might not be. It's just at this exact moment, the creatures and monsters aren't going to immediately attack. Could it be that you caught them doing something and they're not ready to fight. Um, but this is sort of where most of them will start, is this kind of neutral ground. And then it's up to either party of where they want to take this. Uh, yeah. Moving on from that, there's 9 through uh, 11, which is mostly beneficial. They're more than likely going to assist the party, or they see them in a, you know, in a favorable light. But they're not like do or die for them. You know, they're not going to go yeah. out of their way to help them. If, if, they're, if their interests match up, then they'll be willing to do it like a temporary alliance or something. And then there's 12, the very best. And this could be just the party is exactly who or, or, or what the monster was looking for at that moment. They, they trust them. They, you know, as long as the party doesn't like really mess this up, they could have a solid ally. And the thing that I love about the reaction role is you can change those categories. You can change what they mean and you can make them specific to the types of monsters. One of the coolest ways that I've seen this done is to map the, the four medieval humors onto the various categories of the reaction role so that you have phlegmatic reaction roles or melancholic reaction roles. And to just sort of use that so, as, as a way to like differentiate between certain monster types. 
And this dovetails nicely with a, some sort of table or way to generate, like, what is this monster doing when the party finds it? <laughs> you know, mm-hmm. that could be as simple as, as a, you know, a, a D6 table for, like, they're resting, they're working, they're, you know, preparing for something, they're, you know, recreating, uh, or they're, you know, getting ready to go on patrol or something like that. To like super elaborate, like nested tables of they're coming back from a fight and this is how many of them are hurt or they're coming back from a successful raid and this is the kind of loot they have. And you could have a lot of variability here. And these two things, what do they think of me initially before I've ever rolled persuasion, intimidate, whatever? What is their initial reaction? Guess what? That maps really well to the DMG's NPC reactions of, you know, friendly, indifferent, indifferent and unfriendly just saying, uh, <laughs> set those DCs mm-hmm. for your persuasion checks. Uh, that plus what are they doing? Now we have a whole array of different situations that, where the party comes across a monster and, and that's very abil- that variability is going to create more tactically interesting combats when they choose to have them. Because it's not as if they show up in the monster or initiatives immediately rolled and now we're like in a Final Fantasy, like an old school Final Fantasy fight where, you know, we're, we're just going to slug it out. Like, we've got some options here. Something interesting yeah. is going on, you know? Oh, most definitely. Uh, I Yeah, I, I definitely took that advice during Breath of the Fall and created like some insane nested 3D6 tables for yeah. what they find and the, and the state in which they find them. Uh, yeah. Like how, like my, my 3d six tables were like, had like you rolled twice, you found the thing and then you rolled again and each D six mapped to one of three different charts. Mm-hmm. So it's just yeah. three tables lined up. They're all D six tables. And it's like, Oh, there's three to four of them. And they are agitated because they just came back from a fight. You know, yeah. maybe there were eight of them and now there's four. So yeah. uh, I would, and I would change like how, like when, if they were just coming back from a fight or hurt or whatever, I would take some of their health off and, and yeah. you could v- visibly see that these people are messed up. Yeah. Um, but yeah, because yeah. that giving, giving those little nuances to your creatures can change how your players interact. Like, Oh wait, these people are already messed up. I wonder what messed them up. Maybe right. we need to find out. Are there, yeah. is there something bigger in the area? You know, um, Hints but yeah, this is how you can add that nuance. Yeah. 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 There's a big difference between, uh, I rolled up goblin encounter and the next room they come in is just goblins. They're going to fight them. It's boring snooze, you know, we could yeah. totally automate this fight versus two goblins sneaking around trying to figure out what the party's doing and stay out of sight versus 30 goblins hazing half or, you know, a third of their number in a big drunken brawl of some type, making a lot of noise and not paying attention at all. Right. Like, so adding that variability and, and, you know, take those encounter tables and Xanathar's or the DMG or whatever, and like make them specific to your setting, number one, but then consider all the ways in which you might come across these creatures. And for the DM, these questions are things like, why would they talk in the first place? Maybe they don't. Maybe there's no need to do reaction because they're always going to fight. Guess what? You still roll it. Now you just add a penalty, you know, minus five to your reaction roll. That's going to be significant when it's just 2d6, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> so why would they want to talk? What, did, what benefit would they have? What do they want? What does this monster want, really? And even if you've Mm -hmm. just rolled it randomly, you've not prepared for this thing, having some way to quickly generate, it wants this, it wants to eat, it wants loot, it wants to be left alone, it wants revenge on another creature, it, you know, it it wants something, right? And when you start giving your monsters goals and motivations and the like, you're setting the stage for more variable combats. What can the party offer the monster, but also what can the monster offer the party? What incentive do they have maybe not to fight it and instead talk to it? Um, and then, you know, what's the relation of this monster to other monsters nearby? Is it antagonistic? Mm-hmm. Is it, you know, some sort of symbiotic uh, relationship? Do they know about each other? Uh, all of those questions can help you vary up the ways in which the, the players encounter their monsters. And like sometimes, yeah, you just want to kick down the door and fight something. That's okay. But, but if you don't do that every time, you're really giving some options and variety uh, for your players. Oh, most definitely. 
But like you said, sometimes you got to kick down the door and fight. Yeah. And so talked about the exploration. We tried to talk to the monster. So now mm -hmm. let's get let's get to the nitty gritty and draw steel yeah. and yeah. talk about some combat. But let's talk about why we're fighting. Why do we yeah. fight, Jim? Is it because I, we're fighting ourselves? I, I you know, we fight because we want different things, man. We, we, yeah. we just, you know, we've got different things going on. We, we want different things. I mean, we're fighting because we're more than just pieces in a game somewhere that are controlled by other worldly forces, you know? Yeah. Man. <laughs> like, <laughs> blur that line between reality and the game. You know, what, why are we fighting? This, this is the main event, right? Like combat is the main mm -hmm. event. It's got the most rules. All, most of the character abilities uh, for their classes and the like favor combat or help support combat. A lot of people consider D and D a monster fighting game, although not everybody. And I'm glad that's changing, but this is the part that's like most engaging. You get the yeah. most decisions to make. You have the most impact in these moments. Every die roll matters in a combat. And so elevating that further, you want to give your monsters motivations, goals that help set up stakes for the encounter. Like we said earlier, what do they want? What is it that they desire? Why? And especially when they have sought the party out for combat, why are they doing this? Why are they fighting? Mm -hmm. It's one thing to say, you know, you go in a dungeon and you're kicking down the door and this is, you're invading their home and taking all their stuff. Yeah, maybe sometimes. What if it isn't though? What if you're, you're going in their lair because they've all, they got all this stuff by taking it from the locals, maybe your people, right? Like maybe they're doing mm -hmm. this because another creature is forcing them to, they got to pay tribute to another creature bigger and badder than you guys. And so, yeah, yeah they're not going to stop. <laughs> their, their lives are on the line. And at the very least, you need to get them to stop fighting to get them to do anything else. And once you start figuring out, okay, what do they want? How are they going to get it? Set up their goals. What are they, you know, how are they going to achieve what exactly they want out of this encounter? Maybe they don't just want to kill the party, right? Maybe this isn't to the death. Maybe they just want to drive the party away. Maybe they want to capture one of the party members. I mean, that's a whole, whole other subject of whether or not players are going to allow themselves, their characters to get captured. But sometimes that might happen, especially in a TPK situation where, you know, you don't want to, you don't want the game to end, but mm -hmm. you know, now they're, now they're prisoners of the monsters and not like forever, you know, the monsters wanted something out of this and now they're in a, now they have leverage over the characters as far as stakes go a party member getting captured while some people uh, go just just oh never you know never do that <laughs> it's like well you can learn a lot if you're yeah the prisoner of someone yeah. you give mm -hmm. them a little but they're gonna give you stuff back uh i yep. mean you're just recently watched now. avengers again and I, lo I love the scene of black widow where you introduce her and she's being interrogated but she's interrogating her interrogators She's finding out exactly what they know and how they know it yeah. by letting them be stupid and asking her very obvious questions. And yep. like to me, like I love those moments in D&D &D. Yeah. and they're they're yeah. an amazing way. And plus, hey, now you have someone on the inside who's distracting the bads while the other the rest of the party are moving in from outside. Yep. And so when it all kicks off, well, you know, you're right there at, right, right next to the king and that's who you need. Um, yep. So. I yeah, I, I really I, <laughs> options, right? And and because this is such contentious uh, tactic, uh, a lot of players will react very strongly to it. About the only other thing I can think of off you know off the top of my head that that really gets under player skin is taking their stuff away. Which, sorry, players, that's mm -hmm. totally legitimate. Take your stuff away. Come on, is it written on your character sheet? Then it's up for grabs. And yeah. like <laughs> taking them captive, uh, you know, letting maybe the maybe the monsters like they knock them out and then that's it. Like the, that the message was we can do whatever we want with you. We let you, we can, we let you keep your stuff. We didn't harm you after you were gone. We, you were at our mercy and we walked away. And maybe that's a good way to signal to the players that talking next time might not be a bad idea. You know, mm -hmm. not every fight has to be, uh, t you know, to the death. 
And once you've like set stakes other than death for a combat, introducing that variability and enriching your world. Um, the other things to consider are the various strategic, uh, operational and tactical approaches that the monsters might have. This is where I can't speak highly enough of Keith Amon's uh, The Monsters Know What They're Doing blog. It's like the exhaustive detail he goes into by looking at stat blocks and how various monsters will approach a combat situation is like, in my opinion, required reading and probably should have been in the monster manual to begin with um, because yeah. it's it really helps you run these fights. And so thinking thinking in strategy... Why are they fighting? What do they want out of this? You know, how are they setting themselves up to get it? Uh, you know, the, the strategic concerns of, of the monsters are, you know, they're operating at that higher level. And this is the, why are we doing this? What, what ultimate outcome do we want from this? What resources are we going to, you know, allocate to different places to, to achieve this? Then moving down mm -hmm. to the operational, how, how are they, how did they get here? You know, how did they bring those resources to bear at this particular moment, right? This, this is the part that usually gets lost and forgotten when you talk about strategy and tactics, but there is a middle tier, right? There is a, an element where they had to get here somehow. They had to get these mm -hmm. resources to this place, to this time, in this manner. And knowing that, understanding that helps you set up the tactical fight, right? How are they going to fight? How are they going to approach Wait. this situation? Yeah, and also as as if your players are paying attention, sometimes attacking the main host isn't what you do. You attack the supply line. So if you can figure out how that they are moving about the logistics of their operation, you can start to attack the supply lines. Therefore, you start fracturing the force you're up against. And so it is a way, like, like having the DM think about this stuff, but also the players like looking out for these kinds of things are a way for you to have better tactics and to come out on top in your fights, right? Yeah, and the fact that they might not have these things is a clue in and of itself. Oh, they're right. not foraging. They don't have a supply train. They don't seem to have a base of operations at all. Why? What does that mm -hmm. say about the encounter? What does that say about the antagonists that you're facing? And like, I th this is another. <laughs> this is another instance of. DMs, like, give this some thought because this is another way that you can reveal information to the players that will help them make a meaningful decision. And, and mm -hmm. the, the whole crux of, of interesting decisions, meaningful choices, that kind of thing, is that they come with some kind of cost, but that they have a significant impact on the outcome of events. And, yeah. and you know, it's, a, it's another tool in your toolbox for that. Um, other considerations for a fight. How far away are they? Do they know we're here? You know, I think a lot of times in a combat, the, it begins when you're within 60 feet of each other and everyone knows where they are. <laughs> you know? Well, pretty and, much, yeah. That way you can, everyone can see them. <laughs> right, hopefully. sometimes. Uh, sometimes that's all right. But what if it's not? What if you stumble across them? What if, you, what if you, both sides were not aware of each other and you, they literally bump into each other? Right. Uh, what if they've set up an ambush for you or vice versa? Right. These are all things that you can adjust and, and take account for that will vary up how each side approaches it tactically. Right. And as we all know, you know, everybody has has a has has, you know, their strategy and their tactics up until the point where steel starts getting traded. Yeah. And then you have to really test uh, your own metal. And yeah. uh, I think uh, one of the things that people forget about is morale, which I know yes. that you, you are, you are, a, you witness about morale uh, constantly to the masses. So Jim, Absolutely. Hit, hit me with a sermon. Summer. So uh, a battle, a real life battle, an actual real life humans fighting with either spears and shields or assault rifles and, and whatever. When their morale breaks, they stop fighting. And the purpose yeah. both strategically and tactically, right, is to get your enemy to stop fighting you by whatever means, right. but to break their fighting spirit, to take the fight out, like literally take the fight out of them. 
And so having every fight, every monster be to the death, like why are these monsters so suicidal? Why in the yeah. world are they throwing themselves at these combat specialized, nigh on super heroic uh, creature, you know, PCs? They're not complete superheroes, right? It's easy to take down a, a, you know, one through 20. It's easy to drop a PC. All right. You're the DM. Um, but apart from that, like maybe once, it, once the players like kill one of the other monsters, that signals to them that like, oh, oh, we thought this was a scrape. We thought we were just going to have a little tussle. This yeah. is real. We're not ready for this. We give up. You know, like morale used to be one of those things that you would test when the first one of them dies, when like half of them die, and then when like three quarters of them die. And if you get to that three quarters and they're still fighting, that sucks for you the person who's attacking because they are going to fight you to the last costing you resources, costing you time, yeah. costing you all kinds of things. And what if they didn't, right? Like what if you didn't have to now all of those things that aren't just dealing direct damage become viable solutions to a combat we could break their morale by causing them all to run away in fear, right? What, you know, we could start taking them captive and that way they at least know that they're not going to die here and now. And maybe mm -hmm. once we start taking a few of them captive, the rest of them are willing to surrender if, if this is a foregone conclusion. Cast banishment on their leader. One spell. And, you know, what happens then? Does their morale yeah. completely burn? They're like, oh, shit. Um, yeah. Our bad. Yes. Or bad, yeah. And so there's a lot of different ways to model this. You can go with the classic uh, 2d6 usually is is, is uh, similar to a reaction table. They've got a score. You want to roll under it, I think. You could use the one that's in the 5th edition DMG, which is a wisdom saving throw. You could also model this by the fact that like, if they have leaders there, maybe the leaders grant some sort of bonus or, or buff or something to the uh to you know their, to their subordinates and their minions that when that's taken away they, they're not gonna fight like yeah when our captain's here we get like 10 temp hp around like you know like as the abstraction of hp being fighting spirit and and willingness to keep going like it's gone we we now we don't have that buffer where we don't want to fight anymore we're we're out um Sometimes just you don't even have to make it random. You just like set the conditions yourself for when they might surrender. What are the conditions under which these monsters might surrender? If you don't want to leave it up to a die roll, but yeah, like the reaction and morale are the two biggest tools that you've got in your toolbox to vary up combat and to make things interesting. And yeah. Creatures don't fight to the death unless they unless you back them into a corner. There's a reason the Mongols would always leave their opponents a way out, a place to run away, to go tell everybody else how how terrible it is to fight the Mongols, so that they don't have to use any more of their resources. Battle is a risk, right? Mm -hmm. Fighting is a risk. You're you're leaving too many things up to chance. And D and D models this really well in the fact that you're rolling a lot. Right, there's a lot of chance and risk involved in a combat, and I know, you know, a lot of DMs out there have have difficulty making their combats deadly or challenging or whatever. That's that is not something I'm gonna, you know, gainsay or it's not happening. But fighting should be something that the players consider as like maybe a last resort because they're putting it themselves at risk. It's gonna take things away from them, and I just find that kind of play so much more enjoyable than every time we see a monster, we fight it. It's always to the death. And now we've got to rest again. <laughs> we've had our 15 minutes of adventure. We're all tapped out. <laughs> and hence an endless cycle of DMs complaining online and, and players eventually getting bored. You know, finding a way to integrate the creatures like all of you know like saying like fighting isn't necessarily uh, the only way to approach them uh integrating them into your campaign finding a place for your monsters where do they come from what's their origin is it purely supernatural are they products of the you know environment and ecosystem that, that brought them up i favor the more supernatural approach 
not really a fan of the naturalism, you know, e ecology of a monster necessarily. I don't think they all need to be natural creatures. Um, you know, did the gods have something to do with this? Or, or, or can you trace a lineage from every monster back to a specific cosmic power? What if there's like one mm -hmm. uber troll that's like the size of a mountain that, <laughs> that gave birth in some way, little pieces of it fell off here and there to make other trolls? Like, it that's its a nails. way... <laughs> it's nails, which is hair clippings. <laughs> I kind of grow thing. other trolls. <laughs> right. First off, like you're building in a hook for your for your characters there, your players. Like you're enriching your world, and like you're not putting it in the background where the only way the players are going to get to it is through long exposition and things like that. Like you're by embodying your your setting lore in the monsters you have this opportunity to, to marry the two things. DMs love coming up with lore for their worlds. Do it. Love it. Whatever you want. If that makes you happy, do it. But if you can embody that in a monster and then convey it through the encounter, through how they interact, through what people might know about them, that kind of thing, then you've taken your lore and moved it off of your DM notebook page, which the players are not going to read. They're not going to know anything about. And you've made it something they can interact with something that will inform their decisions. That's some galaxy brain shit there, man. Like, <laughs> got to really, uh, you mm -hmm. know, it takes work. And not every monster is going to fit in, but it's worth it. Yeah, yeah. You're going to have some duckbill platypi in there somewhere. And you don't know if they're a mammal <laughs> or what, and they lay eggs, but they, <laughs> you know, like, you're just going to have those, you know. Sure, you don't, don't sure. Be bad. Don't feel bad about it. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, like, you know, be, be the god of your own campaign world, like, and, yes. and figure it all out. And, and regardless of which, where you fall on the spectrum between naturalism and, you know, and supernatural, I, I think it's worth considering and, and where, they, where they come from. The other thing is like, are you using the default D&D lore? Are, you know, are yeah. the orcs the product of, of the god Grumsh and there's a reason why they fight everybody. But... Are you going to take that and just use it without considering it, without thinking it, without figuring out a place for the default lore in your world? Or are you going to do something crazy like I did, which is go through every monster in the monster manual and rewrite the lore for how it fits into your world? And suddenly, uh, you know, whites become space faring, uh, you know, uh, sort of creatures that have extended their life through elaborate alchemical, uh, you know, infusions to the point that they're no longer alive and are able to like steal your life force as well. Because how else are they going to survive the void between stars? Right. Are, are, are mummies just these little like dry creatures? Right? Are they these, you know, dry cadavers, husks of something? Or are they remnants of a powerful sorceress society whose very bandages are stitched with the spells that, that, that gave them eternal life? And like they're looking to bring back their world. They're looking to revive this, this civilization that no one has seen. No one can even remember. Like the ruins of it are dust. But there's a few of them out there and they're working towards it. Like getting that kind of specific and creating your own bespoke homebrew, even if it's just the mm -hmm. best vanilla that you can make. Like I said, it's a way to bring that uh, to the fore by embedding it in the monsters themselves. And mm -hmm. man, if, I'm, as a player, I'm all about that. Tell me, like I will eat up some lore if, if yeah. it is, if I can do something with it as a player. Yeah, especially if you're a player who has played a while. So you know all of the default settings. And yeah. so when you introduce a monster that looks and maybe seems like just a regular old hobgoblin, but now you learn that, no, 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 no. These hobgoblins were all trained by this wizard to be an elite fighting unit of fighting mages. And they have passed that down through the generations. That's why they have such a a grand like militaristic view of magical combat and like mm -hmm. you know now and that's hobgoblins in this world some kind of wizard genghis khan eons ago taught them the way and now they pass it down and this is the way when we consider say the role of legendary monsters and and how they became legendary right yeah they've got names they've got legend associated with them then you can extend that to other types of monsters they don't just have to have legendary actions to be legendary they could be legendary because of what they've accomplished, not because of what their stat block says.
So anyway, yeah. like there, there's a lot to consider, obviously, but the background stuff, the lore stuff, the setting them, you know, integrating the monsters in your world sets up the stage for the interesting encounter. It creates that kind of, uh, you know, hook that's going to get the players uh, in. Yeah, I don't know that I got well, anything I else mean, to say, man. And it, yeah, if you if you got them hooked, then you know, roll initiative, right? There you go. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's read a patron question. In case y'all didn't know, we've got a whole community over on Patreon with lots of different rewards. We've got a whole other podcast. There's a level with a hangout, discounts, and all kinds of stuff. And we read a question from one of our patrons every week here on the podcast. So here we go. So this patron question, y'all, um, they, they're asking, how do we take a success and build on it like at a, at a larger scale, right? Like... They are. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like they they completed a chapter of the adventure, did a big thing, sure. and now they have to take a breath and move on to the next big thing. But like they kind of spin their wheels after that. Yeah, I think that's yeah, a, yeah. that's a common thing. Um, one, Speed I think it. for me, one of the things I try to do, uh, one of the don't want to do this every time, but yeah, there's a success, but then a complication arises from that success. Oh sure, yeah, yeah. You did a thing, but maybe you caused some destruction, which led to a thing. And now you got to clean up the a side effect of that success. Mm -hmm. Like I said, mm -hmm. you don't want to do it every time, but I think it's some it's it's one of the things that you can do uh, yeah. to give yeah. yourself uh, at least like a springboard to at least a direction to go. Yeah. 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 You want to you don't want to like rob them of a, of a sense of victory by like immediately going, oh, you thought you succeeded in your mm -hmm. task but really this other thing is going to completely retcon it get it out of there mm -hmm. um that was just so a I'm thinking, life model decoy of the bad guy <laughs> right yeah yeah i'm thinking <laughs> a couple of a couple, a couple of thoughts on on like building on successes and like one of them is just give yourself a break you know like especially as, on a player level you know yeah like like not expecting to, to immediately get back in and and like all right we just succeeded let's get to the next thing you know like as players give yourself a bit of a break reflect on on what went well what didn't just savor the victory for a bit um and then when you know when that has passed you're you know you're ready to move on to the next thing from mm -hmm. a game perspective um i i keep coming back to my three c's choice uh or context choice and consequence and so even in like achieving a goal or, or whatever, there's still a consequence to that. Now that consequence might be, we got what we wanted and that's great. You know, <laughs> we're going to move on to the next thing we want, but it could be that there's a counter reaction, like not immediately, but at some point a counter reaction from the villain or other elements of the setting, other factions in PCs, that kind of thing um, that you can use to sort of create, set up a new problem. You might also consider yeah. giving the character some downtime in order to uh, that's provide I'm time for that, right? Was that that was your best? <laughs> yeah, I was about to. I was about to be like, you need to give them the Conan coming back and spending all the gold yes. montage scene. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, totally. Savor the, the victory, savoring for the players and the characters. You know, mm -hmm. like let them have some time to enjoy their, you know, their success and fame and whatever. You know, I think there's an expectations of like. Go, 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 go. We got to get to the next thing. No pace. You know, it's like 100% pedal to the metal pacing. And it's like, no, like you're going to burn yourself out and, you yeah. know, not enjoy I the I think game a lot so of people much. hand wave. Yeah, I think a lot of people hand wave downtime of just like, okay, so what do you want your character to do? All right, all right, that happens. Let's move on. And it's like, no, no, no. Yeah. Just like you role play everything else, it's okay to role play some downtime and just yeah. enjoy the enjoy the moment you know uh like you were saying let them let them be famous because they saved the town from the dragon and let it like yeah. throw a party uh but may, maybe at the end of that party that's when the dragon cultists because you just killed their god want to retaliate or sure. you know steal steal yeah. something of the town and now you have a, a clue to to set off in the next leg of the adventure yeah um, yeah and it, it doesn't even need to be like 
immediate what what dungeon world would call a hard move like you're going to do something directly to the players it could be something yeah. like well you hear rumors that remnants of the cult you busted up are you know spreading throughout the you know the neighboring city states and you know you, you didn't like cockroaches they've scattered to the far corners mm -hmm. of, of in dark places and if you want you could follow up on that but then you're also hearing rumors of something else entirely. You know, it could be connected. Is it? Maybe. It's worth going and taking a look. And that's like on top of the fact that they might have something they want to do themselves now that this is cleared out of the way. You're like, oh, yeah, we did this so that we could do this, you know. So um, part of creating like a living world that the players can move around in and have some agency in is keeping a lot of plates spinning at the same time and knowing which one you're going to bring put to the foreground, which one the players are going to bring to the foreground, and then which ones are just sort of in the background. Maybe they're always there waiting for the players to interact with them. Maybe they resolve themselves or move along some sort of progression without the player's mm -hmm. interaction. Um, kind of creates a mini game for the DM between sessions just to see what all oh, totally. is going on with your, uh, with your various hooks and schemes. Well, well, Jim, this is why I love a good random table. Certainly. Uh, for those downtime activities, when you want to, if you want to throw like a small challenge at them, but not like yeah. anything overt or connected, if you just need an episode, like a filler episode, which isn't really yeah. necessarily need to be a filler. This is where they get to develop their characters a bit, interact yeah. with the community, form mm -hmm. some ties, some bonds, yep. Uh, yep. Yep. you know, maybe find a wife out there, you know, uh, who knows? Uh, come on, people! You can't you can't Get be a, a, a loner for your entire <laughs> life. You got to give the DM some fodder for future adventures. Sure, yeah, but that, that's a good that's a good uh, point you're making there because the downtime, even if you're doing a whole session where it's just like, guys, we're just gonna, this is a bookkeeping session, right? Mm -hmm. Not like in the boring sense, but just in the catch up sense. Little things you wanted to do, you know, downtime activities that we want to zoom in on and, and resolve, but like. Those aren't in isolation. Those could lead to further adventure. Oh, I split all, spent mm -hmm. all my money at the uh, down at the casino, and uh, you know, talk to these people there. But you know, guess what? Somebody saw that I was spending all that money, and now they're they've taken an interest in me. You know, yep. or I heard this thing when I was at the temple performing my temple duties or whatever. You know, or helping out the local uh, you know nobility with their duties or something like that. Or or doing that yourself right like as you get up in the campaign presumably pcs are taking positions of leadership and those moments between when they've accomplished their goals is the chance to be like this is what you kind of get up to when you're not adventuring you know mm -hmm. <laughs> this is your daily normal I'll, life <laughs> yeah i'll say i mean i think i've pretty i think i've said this before uh, on other shows but like when we were running my spelljammer game those were some of my favorite episodes when y'all would just do downtime and like work on the ship or you'd find a port and it's like, no, no, just have fun because yeah. whatever y'all did, that's exactly what I was doing. Like yeah. Zelo's over there sneaking around doing, making contacts and stuff like that. Meanwhile, you know, uh, uh, Audie's character and Emma's Druid, her, her star Druid are, mm -hmm. are, are doing whatever at the market. Um, yeah. You know, those are the times where you're just like, Hmm, what can I use here? You know, what did they did here? they bring some crazy artifact from a far flung sphere? And yeah. who's going to be interested in that? And yeah, you know, so yeah. Yeah. what happened? Let in the, the player prior give adventure. you something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What let them give you something? What happened in that prior adventure that maybe they seemed interested in but weren't able to follow up on at the time, or that you know, but they don't. That there's a, still a loose end that's going to come mm -hmm. back and 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 uh, be a problem for them like that's that's like i said that's part of the, the living world that you're creating and so like building on those successes is how you bring that living world to the attention of the players that the world doesn't just entirely react to them that the npcs aren't just standing around waiting for them to open the door or show up to them before they come to life yeah. you know Waiting for that room to load so that the NPC <laughs> begins its algorithm. It's routine. Um, yeah. It's dialogue routine. <laughs> yeah.